can't tell you how happy I am to see all of you here. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be able to preach from the Word of God. One of the points that we're going to make in the lesson today is how much of a responsibility that it is that we're speaking the truth. And that's what I want to be sure that I'm doing today. So you would be my friend to bring up something that I have brought up that might not be the truth. While I was thinking of what I wanted to speak on, I did as a lot of us men do, and we think to ourselves, what do I need to work on? What do I truly need to work on? The lesson I would like to bring to you today is about, are you fully committed? Am I fully committed? The first thing that we'll talk about in being fully committed is being fully committed in prayer. In Romans chapter 12, this tells us to be constant in prayer. Prayer should come so naturally to us that we ever ne never stop doing it. It should be as if we were breathing. That's how often we should pray. Prayer should be like water to our plants. Let me ask you a question. How well would your plants or would your flowers grow if you watered them as often as you prayed? Maybe we don't pray as often as we should because we feel powerless in what our prayers can accomplish. But think about this. Let's read James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, and see what scriptures say about that. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for, excuse me, he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three, three years, six months, it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. James reminds us here that Elijah was a man just like me and you. But in his prayer, he changed the lives of many of those that were worshiping the idol Baal. We see here that the power was not in Elijah as the power is not in us. All the power in prayer is found in the one that we pray to. So what should we pray for? Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. For of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all who are are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of god our savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth for there is one god and there is one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Here we read that we should pray for those that are in a leadership position. We should also pray for all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. One of the things that I think we as Christians have to be very, very careful about 
especially in social media, it's very easy to fall into the trap of going along with, I guess we can just call it political bashing, saying something bad or agreeing with someone that said something bad about someone that we perhaps do not agree with. This should not be an attitude or an action of a child of God. God's will is for us to pray for those that are outside the kingdom. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 11, it shows the saints played a huge role in the protection of those serving God in dangerous places. As members here at Eastside, we know of many people that are serving God, that are preaching the gospel in places where the gospel is not welcome. We have to be sure to be committed to praying for those because they definitely need it. Other examples of being committed to prayer, the apostles in Acts gave us many examples, but a couple that I want to bring forth to us today. Um, in one Acts chapter 1, verse 24 through 25, here's an example of the, the apostles praying for boldness. Also in chapter 4 and verse 29 through 20, uh, 31, I'm sorry, I got my notes mixed up. In Acts 1, 24 through 25, they're praying for the important decisions that are needing to be made. Then in Acts 4, 29 through 31, we see them praying for boldness for the situations that are going to be coming up. There are going to be days that are going to come soon, maybe later, where we're going to need that boldness. We're going to need to make the right decisions. And brothers and sisters, we need to pray for that now. That time might not be here right now, but we need to pray for it diligently right now so that when the time comes, we will be fully committed. And finally, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter encourages us to cast all of our cares on God in prayer. Now, why would we do that? Because God cares for you. God cares for me. We're serving a loving and generous God. The creator of the universe cares for you. But we have to listen to his conditions. We have to want his will to be done and not our own. When we pray to God to provide for us, do we oftentimes have the attitude, well, I wonder if that worked. Brothers and sisters, if you think the answer is no, then it didn't. It didn't do any good. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, Jesus said that whatever we ask for in prayer, we will receive it if we have faith. But again, we have to allow we have to allow God's will to happen, not our own. We have to align our will to his and believe that he is able to answer us. Now that we've talked about being fully committed in prayer, as we know in prayer, we're talking to God. So in a conversation, we've done our part of talking. Are we doing our part in listening? Are we fully committing ourselves to studying God's word? What do we gain by studying what God has to say? We study God's word so that we can be strengthened in our souls. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, and then later in 14 through 17, it tells us that if we are weak in our knowledge in Scripture, 
Satan can creep into our homes, creep into our lives, and tear us down with deception. Being deceived usually means that we'll believe whatever we're told. We are deceived if we don't know the truth. But if we are strong in our knowledge of God's truth, we will be wise for our salvation. In Acts 17, verse 11, and also in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it advises us in the same way. It's our responsibility to have the answers for why we believe what we believe. You ever heard someone say, the reason why I believe this is because brother so-and-so told me, the preacher told me, that's not an acceptable answer. We will never truly know God if we don't study his word. And it will be impossible to please him in the things that we do. One of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, we need to fully commit to study is so that we can be unified in Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples, but also he's praying for us to be sanctified in truth, set apart by truth. Do we live our lives as being set apart from the world because we stand for truth? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Are we fully committed to study? Now that we've studied God's word, what's next? How committed are we in teaching God's word? We have a great responsibility to make sure that we are teaching the truth. But also, we have to make sure that our motives are pure. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, this has some pretty strong words for those who have no interest in teaching the truth or that have something that they could get as a personal gain out of it. The reasons that some may teach is so that we can show how much we know. But I'll tell you this, we need to let our motivation be that no man should perish from not knowing God's word. Something else to think about. Are we committed to teaching everyone? God has commanded us to take the truth to everyone. We're not responsible for their obedience, but we know that they can't obey what they don't know. We have an example of this in Ezekiel 3, verses 16 through 19. Ezekiel 3, 16 through 19. And at the end of seven days, the word of the, word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word, from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from their wicked ways, in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die in his iniquities. But his blood I will re require at your hands. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not return from his wickedness, or from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquities. But you will have delivered your soul. God tells Ezekiel here that he is to be a watchman for the house of Israel. He is to warn them of their sins. God reassures him
obey. That's on if he didn't take the time to warn the people of their wicked ways, as it reads. We will face punishment because of our neglect to teaching others. Are we being a good watchman for the world? What does God say we should do when someone is not willing to listen? In Acts chapter 13, 45 through 49, Paul and Barnabas are boldly telling the Jews that since they would not hear the truth, the Gentiles would be faced, or excuse me, the Gentiles would be their focus in saving. And here the Gentiles rejoiced and glorified in the word of God. They were hungry for the word. Brothers and sisters, there are those that we know that are hungry for the word of God. They need God in their lives. Are we helping them find God? Are we helping them find the bread of life? Obviously, we can't see into everyone's heart to know, are they seeking the truth? But we do need to try to reach out through our actions. In Philippians 2, verses 15 through 16, it encourages us to shine our lights in the world by holding fast to the word of life. That's a form of teaching that we can all do. Believe it or not, there are those in the world that are not used to people living righteously. And it makes a difference in their lives. They might not say anything to you, but it definitely makes a difference. And we need to be aware of that. Jesus tells us that we are to be the light of this world. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Jesus didn't say, I want you to go stand out just a little bit. I want you to stand out if it's not convenient to you. I don't want you to step on anyone's toes. He didn't say that. He said, we are the light. How bright are we shining? Now that we've talked about being committed, being fully committed in teaching the Word of God, the next point I'd like to bring up is, are we committed in our worship service and in our worship to God? Are we giving our best in our worship? We read in Genesis chapter 4, in verses 3 through 5, about Cain and Abel, Abel was pleasing to God because he offered God the first of his flocks as a sacrifice. We don't know exactly why the, Cain's offering was not pleasing to God, but his offering was not specified as being the best or being the first of his fruits. God desires our best. I'd like to kind of um, throw a scenario out there. Imagine if you were scheduled to meet with someone tomorrow that was a very high stature to you. Doesn't matter who. Could be your favorite sports player, movie star, the president, whatever. <laughs> Imagine if you were going to meet with that person in the morning. How would you prepare yourself for that meeting? Would you run hard all day before and stay up late that night? Would you sleep in until absolutely the last moment that morning so that you would not be late? And just throw on some clothes that are, I guess, the least wrinkled out of your closet? Or would you use this day to perhaps clear your mind? Study up on topics to discuss? Would you go to bed early 
so that you would be well rested and not dozing off during that meeting? Would you get up early the next morning to make sure that you have what you want to wear out and looking nice? Which way did we prepare for worship this morning? Once we get to service, how did we prepare for service today? How involved do we tend to be? Do we just sit back and observe the things that are going on? Or do we fully engage in worship? How many of us have been guilty of coming in, sitting in our pew on Sunday, but our minds are in other places? Perhaps we're thinking about the things to come in the next week. Or perhaps we're thinking about the things that happened the week before. Or even worse, what's for lunch? Perhaps even you're thinking negatively about a brother or sister, perhaps of something they have said, something they've done to you. Brothers and sisters, we're here to worship God, our creator. But instead, we're thinking about other things. If we are fully committed to giving God our best in worship, that will be pleasing to him. We come here to worship God, not to focus on the imperfections of the world. Think about it this way. When you're watching your favorite team, or perhaps a movie that you're very excited about, what do we do? We sit up close as we can, turn off the volume on the TV. We make sure that there's no interruptions that we can help if possible. And also we're excited about it. Now I'm not looking for you to jump up and down during this service. If I say something that gets you excited, you can slap me a high five later, but I think you get my point. I think too often we feel uncomfortable. We feel like I just need to sit here. I just need to be quiet. I don't need to get excited about worship service. I have to tell you, it's very encouraging when somebody gives the preacher a hearty amen for what's being agreed upon because sometimes the preacher needs it and the people around them need to know that you agree with what's being said. Along with that same subject, do we have in our minds that, man, the preacher's running a, real, a little long, but so far I'm doing good. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 through 29, it reads, Therefore, let us be grateful to receive, grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Does that sound like how we worship? Are we fully committed to worshiping God? Are we fully committed in our homes? Husbands and wives, are we truly committed to loving and submitting to each other? As it says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19. Husbands, we have the honor to live with our wives as a great gift from God. We must treat them as that gift that they are. They are fellow heirs to the grace of eternal life. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Wives, you have such a huge role in the success of the home. In Proverbs 14, we're told that the wisest of women builds her house, 
But folly, with her own hands, tears it down. Wives, you are the glue that makes the home succeed. And please don't take this lightly. And husbands, we need to make sure that they understand that we support them. We husbands know that we, when we have the support of our wives in the home, we have a loved and blessed home, as it says in Proverbs chapter 31. I think Steve made a very powerful point not too long ago in one of the classes that we were in. He brought up the point or the example of what the example that women play in the submission of men to God. Wives, if your husband submitted to God the same way that you submit to their husbands, would God be pleased? Let's read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 through 24. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, should submit in everything to their husband. All in all, we both have to treat each other with honor. Skipping down uh, to verse 33, sums up the thought, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. As children, or excuse me, as far as raising our children, are we fully committed to making sure that we're raising our children to the glory of God? In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7, God has revealed through Moses how the Israelites were to love him, to keep and teach his commandments to their children. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Notice in this verse, the word diligently is used. When I looked this up to kind of get a deeper meaning of the use of this word in this passage, I read busy, active, engaged, tied up, and working. Could these words be used to how we as parents try to raise our children in the Lord? A lot of times we can spend more time on things such as education, sports, playing an instrument, and etc. While those things aren't bad, we have to make sure that we're not slacking on the most important thing that we need to be teaching them. In Psalms chapter 127 and verse 3 through 5, this is one of my favorite verses. It reads, Behold, children are the heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of the one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemy when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. We're to equip our children to fly out as arrows into the world. We need to be sure that right now we're aiming them toward the Lord, toward the truth. In Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, it tells us fathers to bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
Also in the home, are we committed to caring for our parents or grandparents? In 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 4, it tells us the care for those who can't care for themselves falls on the children or the grandchildren. Are we giving that command our all? Paul's instructing Timothy here that by caring for our aging loved ones, we are showing them godliness. Are we being godly in our care? Or are we like the Pharisees that Jesus rebuked in Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 7? He reminds us in verse 10 of what the law of Moses said. In the verses following, Jesus is getting on to the Pharisees for placing tradition above the law of God when they decide to give their money to God out of tradition rather than caring for their parents. God's law says what? Honor your father and mother. Finally tonight, I would like to talk about being committed to serving one another. We aren't going to take the time to read this chapter, but in John chapter 17, this is the prayer that we were talking about earlier where the disciple, or excuse me, this is the prayer that we talked about earlier for the disciples and for us. He prayed for us to be set apart from the world by truth. But he also prayed that we would be unified. Can we truly unite ourselves with each other without love for one another? Jesus had already taught the disciples about serving one another in chapter 13 by washing their feet. He is asking the Father to unify us as God and Christ are. That's a very strong bond. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, it tells us that by loving and bearing each other's burdens, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. Are we truly bearing each other's burdens? No matter what the circumstances, are we trying to help one another? In Galatians chapter 5, in verse 13, it talks about putting others first. If we love God and fully commit ourselves to serving Him in love, we will love those who are born of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, we find this beautiful description. So tonight, or excuse me, so this morning, what we've talked about is being committed with our prayers to the study of God's Word, to the teaching of others, being fully committed in worship to God in our homes, and being fully committed in the service and love for our brethren. So I want to ask you the question again. Are you fully committed? All these things leave no room for halfway service. We are to fully commit ourselves in order to please our Father, who loves us, cares for us more than any way that we can understand. I do appreciate all of your attention and patience. Right now, I would like to extend an invitation If you want to be fully committed to God, there's a plan that you have to start. God has gave us instruction on how to become a child of His. First, we have to hear the Word of God. We have to believe it. 
repent of our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and being baptized for the remission of our sins. Once we've done that, we've begun the journey. We also see in Revelations 2 verse 10, to, rem to remain faithful unto death. Are we fully committed to God, to Christ, to our duties as a child of His? If there is anything that you need to be done, I've asked Brother Merle to come forward and be ready to assist anyone that needs to make correction in their lives, especially for one that might need to become a child of God, to be fully committed, as we're told we should. Thank you again for your attention. Here in just a moment, we'll have the song of invitation. Please think about these things as we stand and sing.